All right, we had uh, a couple of assignments over the last few days to put together this week, pages 60 and 63. So let's go over that together. If you're at home and have not done those questions yet, stop the tape. Come back and check it later. All right, everybody ready? Anybody not have it? All right, good. Page 60. What was the Eastern civilization that threatened the Greeks at the outset of the 5th century? Amelia. Um, at the outset of the 5th century BC, the West were advanced to the Persian Empire, but in Greek independence and isolation. That is correct. The Persian Empire. Number two. Uh, what was the battle where an or unorthodox charge by the Greeks helped them win a decisive victory? Mia. Yeah. The battle of No. Sorry. Battle of Marathon. Battle of Marathon is the correct answer. The Battle of Marathon. Number three. Across what body of water did Xerxes make a bridge of boats to move his army? Zach? Hellespont. The Hellespont. Number four. Uh, who was the influential leader of Athens during the so-called Golden Age? Stephen. Xerxes was the influential leader of Athens during the so-called Golden Age. Do you like to try his name again? Let's see. How do you have it spelled? Xerxes. Is that how you have it spelled? No, I don't know how to spell it. How do you, tell me how you have it spelled. You have what? And the I and parentheses. Okay, so you just mix a couple of letters up. Okay, that was, so that's why you were mispronouncing. Pericles is the name. Uh, number five, what type of war was the Peloponnesian War? John? Type of war that the Peloponnesian War was a civil war. That's right, it was a civil war. So it was a war between groups within a country. Okay, five points on that page. Now we go to page 63. Over what kingdom did Philip II rule, Griff? Philip II ruled over Macedonia. That is correct. And I think I, I told you that I found out. In, while I was in Greece, that they pronounce it with a hard C. They pronounce it Macedonia. Not how I've ever heard anybody else pronounce it, but that's what they say over there, is Macedonia. So if uh, I mean, you've heard me say that in the past, that's why. It's not that I'm an idiot. I'm pronouncing it the way the Greeks do. Okay. Uh, number two, who is still, who, who it says in your question? I've never noticed that before. <laughs> who instilled in Alexander the Great a love for Greek culture? Noah? Yes, John. Right. How many of you noticed the hoo hoo? Does yours, does yours have hoo hoo? Did you notice that? You know, I've read that for 30 years or whatever. I never noticed the hoo hoo before. Number three. The three ruling families that ruled portions of Alexander's empire. Now, your book only gave you three, I gave you the four. And the region. So, uh, give me one family, Amelia. Um, the Polish and Egypt. Right, the Ptolemies in Egypt is a silent P. Okay. Ptolemy in Egypt. All right, that's two points, one for each of those parts. Uh, give me another family, Mia. Uh, the Correct, that's another two points. And the third family, Zach? The Antigonids. Okay, and what did what they rule? Uh, Stephen, what did what the Antigonids rule? Northern Macedonia and Greece. Right, Macedonia and Greece. All right, so six points on number three. You need to have the family and where they rule, which gives us eight points on that page. Griff, you have a question? Are they Antigonids? I had Macedonia, but not Greece. Uh, we'll take that. Any other questions? Okay. What I say? What's the total? Eight and what's the five? So thirteen. Yeah. Uh, so put the uh, number no, incorrect at the top. Circle it. One of you put in the slash fifteen. So I have to recount that. And then let me have your papers. Do you have a question, Zach? Uh, I had done. I didn't bring anything down. Uh, okay, so that'd be a point for each of them. So that'd be, if you didn't miss anything else, that'd be minus three. If you had the families and not where they ruled, that would be three points that you missed. Okay, let me have those.
All right, now let's get back into our notes and proceed with our study of uh, Greece. And we're going to look at, uh, today at the Greek culture. We have seen the origins of Greek culture, Greek civilization. Uh, we've looked at the two main cities, Sparta and Athens, uh, the Peloponnesian War. Uh, we saw the earlier the Persian War against Greece. Uh, now we want to just uh, take a step back and look at Greek culture. Uh, and the word for Greek culture is Hellenism. It comes from the, the Greek, uh, the word for the, the Greeks use for themselves, Helen, or Hellenic. So Greek culture. First of all, the essence of Greek culture. They emphasized values and character. Values and character, in what ways? Well, they expressed an appreciation for beauty, freedom, justice, truth, and knowledge. Those were the things that they believed were the, the best things in life, the good things in life. We'll see. Secondly, they exalted man with his creative spirit, versatile talents, thirst for knowledge, physical ability, and zest for life. Is there anything you need to explain there? So they appreciated all the good things in life that they saw, that they, that they thought were good things. And also they uh, said man is the top. Man is the best there is. Uh, man is the, the one who brings about all those good things. They also had respect for self-control, restraint, balance, and moderation. So they followed the axiom Nothing in excess and everything in proportion. Don't go to extremes. Any questions? Next. Under the essence of Greek culture, we want to consider the fact that it becomes the cradle of Western culture. So Greece has a tremendous effect on everything to the west of Greece, especially, and some to the east. But all of uh, the culture of what would become Europe and then into America is affected by Greek culture. Uh, so first in the area of science. Uh, there were a lot of Greeks that were involved in science, in, in mathematics. Uh, you. Uh, or in algebra, or geometry, any of those of those math courses, you will come across Greek mathematicians, ideas that came from Greek mathematicians. The area of philosophy, that is uh, examining life, determining the meanings of life. Many of the Greeks were involved in that and influenced uh, many people after them. Uh, the area of literature. The Greeks are famous for their literature. In fact, uh, we find the Apostle Paul occasionally using Greek literature in his preaching and writing. In Acts 17.28, Paul refers to the Greek poets in general, and then he quotes from the Phenomena, which is a poem by Aratus in the 3rd century BC, when he says, we are his offspring. In 1 Corinthians 15.33, Paul quotes from Thais, a play by Menander, also the 3rd century B.C. But he says, evil communications corrupt good manners. Paul quotes Epimenides of Crete from the 7th century B.C. in Titus 1.12 when he says, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, evil beasts, slow bellies. When Paul records his conversion experience, he relates that the Lord said to him, it is hard for you to kick against the pricks or the ox goads. Uh, this is a statement 
uh, that comes originally from the play Agamemnon by uh, Aeschylus. Uh, Greece also affected the areas of architecture. We have look around at uh, some of the buildings in our own country and we'll see the influence of the Greeks. And then in sculpture as well. And we'll talk more in detail about uh, who specifically influenced uh, the rest of the world a little bit later. Well, the Greeks, through Alexander's conquests, conquered the world. And through that, he spread the Greek language and Greek culture. When they blended with other cultures, it formed a new culture, which was called Hellenistic. That is, when any culture was conquered by the Greeks, when they adapted some of the Greek ideas or embraced some of the Greek ideas into their own, that's called Hellenistic or Hellenization. It means like the Greek. The Hellenistic age united the peoples of the Near East. So to the east of Greece, over in the area from Babylon, Persia, Egypt, Palestine. By blending their arts, religions, philosophies, and customs, bringing east and west together in learning, in government, and in trade. So Hellenism, being Hellenistic for those that were conquered by Greece, uh, meant that they embraced the Greek culture, made it part of their own, blended it with their own culture, and uh, as that spread because of Alexander the Great, and then uh, further on uh, from that, uh, much of the, the world around the Mediterranean becomes Hellenized. It becomes oriented toward the Greeks. All right, let's look now at the expressions of Greek culture. First of all, there is a focus on man. So we could say it's very humanistic. The uniqueness of man in the ability to think and reason made him worthy of special study, which is true. But the problem is they didn't look to where man originated, and that is with God, to find the answer to those issues. Uh, this formal study of human thought and culture is called the humanities. Studying humans, their thoughts and culture is called the humanities. We still call it that today in colleges and universities. You can be a student of the humanities. But, as I said, in stressing the dignity and uniqueness of man, they overlook the Creator. And that is called humanism. Any questions? All right, let's go on to the interest in philosophy. Philosophy means love of wisdom, made up of two Greek words, philos, or phileo, which means brotherly love, and sophos means wisdom. So a lover of wisdom is a philosopher. So what were the philosophers trying to do? The philosophers were trying to find answers to the basic questions of life. And this is true throughout history. People are trying to find answers. Unfortunately, if they don't know where to look, they come up with incorrect answers sometimes. But here are the answers, or here are the questions that the philosophers are trying to answer. Where did I come from? Many people ask that question today. Why am I here? Asked, asked by many people today, why am I here? And sometimes, even as Christians, we might ask that question, why am I here? Where am I going? And some of that might be reflected in 
uh, the idea that uh, I don't know my purpose. Why am I on this earth? And then what is the highest good in life? Now, those are basic questions that one asks that fit into the realm of philosophy, uh, but we could say they fit on, into the thoughts of most people uh, who don't realize that they are philosophical questions. They're simply questions of life, but that's what philosophy is all about. Now, for the Greeks, they had a certain presupposition that affected the answers to those questions, and that is they believed in the goodness of man and in his ability to use his reason to search for wisdom. They believe they had the capacity to search out wisdom to answer these questions, believing that man is good in himself and he can come up with the right answers for his reason. Any questions about the, the questions of philosophy and their basic presupposition? All right, let's look at the first philosopher that we have on our list here. His name is Thales of Miletus, and he's considered the father of philosophy. <clears throat> he is credited with the development of what is called the Ionian science of nature. He sought to explain the origin of the universe in natural terms, concluding that water was the origin of the universe. Does that sound familiar? That the universe began in water, or the life began in water? Well, there's a reason why he is considered the first evolutionist, because that's what evolution teaches, doesn't it? The, Life came out of the primordial swamp, out of water. Uh, the explanation was that these first living things developed a hard skin, and in time they washed up on the dry banks where they were baked by the sun. After a while, the tough outer skin cracked off and the creatures lived on. The Ionians were the first people in history to dismiss the supernatural altogether. His follower, Anaximander, proposed that the origin of man came about a bit differently because man has a long period of dependent infancy. He had to have sprung from a different animal, in fact, from a fish, which he at first resembled. Now, we might think that sounds kind of far-fetched, but in reality, is it any more far-fetched than Darwinism? which believes that one kind of an animal turns into another kind of an animal just by chance. And the animals at some point had to develop eyes and a brain and all the different things we have in our body, that those developed on their own by chance through um, mutations of some kind. Uh, you know, it's just, it's remarkable uh, to think that people would believe that. Uh, now, especially now that we know about DNA and, and the computer-like activities that occur within our body. It's unreal. So I'm not sure that Thales was any worse of a uh, scientist in his philosophy than Darwin. All right, here's another thing that he came up with. Uh, the first proof that for any chord, A, B, in a circle, all of the uh, angles subtended by points anywhere on the same semi-arc of the circle will be equal. But maybe you come across that in math, I don't know. Probably geometry in many places. All right, so Thales was uh, the considered the father of philosophy and uh, was one of the first people to espouse the idea of evolution, although I think we can trace evolution uh, back uh, all the way to the uh, original civilizations in some way. But he's expressing an idea of how life started and how it developed into man. Uh, the next person that we want to consider is Socrates. Socrates uh, is, should be someone that you have heard of. Uh, he was devoted to truth 
and teaching men how to conduct their lives. His famous motto was, know thyself. Know yourself as the key to living. Know who you are. He said things like, the, unex un the unexamined life is not worth living. If you want to live a life full of purpose, you need to examine your own life. You need to know who you are. Now, he developed a system of teaching, which is called the Socratic method. And that means you ask leading questions, followed by the analyzing of the students' answers, and try to get the students to come up with the answers, and so that they learn them uh, better on their own. Of course, he believed that truth can be attained through human reason. He believed that virtue is knowledge. That another doing what's right is self-knowledge. Ignorance produces evil. Thus, reason is the best guide to good behavior. Now, eventually, he was accused of corrupting the youth and rejecting the gods of Athens, and so was condemned to death. And so he famously drank a cup of hemlock, which was poisonous, which caused him to die. The famous painting of the death of Socrates. And we will talk more about Socrates on Monday. Uh, the assignment you have for Monday is to read the Apology of Plato, which is written about Socrates. It's in the packet of materials you have towards the back of your packet. The Apology of Plato, and there's some questions to answer there. So you can uh, do that now. You can use the rest of the time to work on the Apology of Plato.